Today's khutbah is dedicated to a few ayat that belong to Surah Ar-Rahman, one of the most famous surahs of the Qur'an. Uh, so many parts of the Muslim world, we take a select few surahs that the Muslims have a special affiliation towards because of some narrations that are famous about those surahs. And Surah Ar-Rahman is certainly one of them. In many cultures around the world, especially in Southeast Asia, the recitation of Surah Ar-Rahman is very, very common. At the same time, what is also tragic is a lot of peop most people who recite and love the surah and have heard it so many times uh, don't know what it says, don't know what Allah Azza wa is saying. And so let's take advantage of that love that we have for the surah and actually try to learn something about it as well. This surah uniquely, Allah Azza wa repeats the same phrase multiple times, an unusual frequency of times. It keeps every few ayat, Allah keeps uttering the same thing over and over again. And that statement roughly translates, and this is actually, if you don't understand this statement, you won't, you'll miss the point of the entire surah. Allah Azza wa is in a very emphatic way declaring what favors, what wonders, what incredible things that your master has done are you going to be in denial of. That's a very rough translation, but essentially Allah keeps asking how much, how much more in denial can you be? How much more stuff can you ignore? How much more, how much more can Allah do for you all around you? And you pretend that it's not Allah who's the one doing it. How blind can you be? And he keeps asking that question over and over and over again. Now, you know, scholars grapple with the problem, why does Allah repeat himself like that? Why does he keep repeating that question time and time again? And it's also baffling because in the beginning Allah talks about what he created in the world and then asks that question. Later on he's going to start describing judgment day and he'll ask that question again. Then a few ayat about Jahannam, hellfire, then he'll ask that question again. Then every few ayat about Jannah, he'll ask that question again. So it's not like it's the same subject. There are literally five different subjects in the surah and he still asks the same exact question over and over and over again. And so it begs, you know, it really makes one curious and you would have to understand that Qur'an is بِلِسَانٍ عَرَبِيٍ مُبِينٍ Allah even says إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِمْ Messengers came in the language of the people. And the Arabic of the Qur'an is very clear. In other words, you don't have to come up with some exhaustive, technical, complicated, philosophical explanation. It's actually very natural. When someone is angry with you, they repeat themselves. And especially if they're asking a question, sometimes to, to scold somebody, for example, a teacher is yelling at the students because most of them failed a test. Didn't we go over this? Didn't we review this 10 times? Did I not teach you? Did I not do my job? In other words, when a teacher repeats those questions, it's an expression of, I did everything I could, why didn't you do your part? And the more he repeats that question, is an expression of how angry he is. And how upset he is with people who've taken advantage, like in the case of the example I gave you, of a teacher who did everything he could for every single student. Is there any question? I'll stay after class, I'll help you however I can, and you still do this. And you still fail the exam. And you still miss the most obvious. You know? Allah Azza wa Jal, as angry as he is in this surah, it's so amazing that he began with one of his names, Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman. Because if he wasn't Ar-Rahman, then anybody else who made Allah this angry, they wouldn't exist anymore. They would have been in Allah's punishment already. So the point of the surah is that you and I, or humanity rather, has made Allah extremely upset. Allah, has, Allah is extremely disappointed with humanity. And the only reason Allah is not executing what, he, what they deserve is because He's Ar-Rahman. More particularly actually, not all of humanity, but particularly the, the first audience of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So let's first understand the example, even though these are not the ayat I want to share with you today. But I do want to set the stage for the ayat that I did want to discuss with you. Allah Azza wa Jalla is talking to Quraysh, and many argue this is almost almost a decade of Quran has already come down. Ten years of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is reciting the Quran to the people of Mecca, and then comes Surah Ar-Rahman. So it's a long time into the period, the Meccan era, that this surah is revealed. I want you to appreciate what happened. Allah did not send His Messenger except as a loving, an act of loving care and mercy for all nations and all peoples. But the special favor was done, among the unlettered, among these Arabs who had no civilization, they had no massive buildings, they had no great armies, they had no great accomplishments, they had nothing. They were the nobody of the world. And Allah decides to send His greatest Messenger to them. 
They had no reason, and by the way, these are not just, maybe they're, maybe they're not great in the worldly sense. Maybe then they're great in the spiritual sense. Maybe these are people that worshipped Allah or had proven themselves in ibadah. No, these were people of shirk also. So in the worldly sense, they were the most backwards. And in the spiritual sense, they were also the most backwards. And forget being the most backwards, you know, in India or in China or in other places, you will find, you know, Buddhist temples and Hindu temples and things like that. Here you found the house of Allah built by Ibrahim alayhi salam turned into a temple. That's far worse a crime than any other t pagan place. Any other place, they built it to worship idols to begin with. But they've actually taken a place that was pure and corrupted that place. So they are in the spiritual sense the most backwards. They are in the worldly sense the most backwards. Relegated, useless, even the Roman Empire doesn't want to conquer them. They're not interested. Because what are they going to get out of the desert? They don't care. The Persians don't want to conquer them. They're left alone to their devices, you know, hurting and, and, and you know, being Bedouins in the desert and that's it. They're left alone. And those people Allah chose to give the best of all messengers, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the most incredible of the one that was sent as a model to all of humanity. And then He gave the greatest revelation, the Qur'an, to those people. And then He decided He won't just give them the whole thing at once, he will give it to them in their language first of all, from a person who they already respect, so they're inclined to listen. And on top of that, he will give it to them ala muktin, little by little by little at the right occasion, so that it's easy for them to learn. You see, in good education, you need a good teacher, you need a good curriculum, right? And you need, a, you need lessons that the teacher can relate to your situation. All of that is perfect when it came to Quraysh. You couldn't find a better teacher. Inni bu'ithtu mu'alliman. I was sent as a teacher. All teachers after him will be inspired by his teaching. You couldn't get a better curriculum than Allah's own words. It couldn't be more designed to meet your needs because he's the one who made you and then he sent you these instructions. Allah ya'lamu man khalaq. So they should have been the most grateful of all people in the world. That they receive this Qur'an, they receive this gift. And over the course of these 10 years, what have they done? They've made fun of this Prophet, they've even attempted to torture and beat him. They've, they've ignored the Qur'an, ignored these lessons that Allah gave. And by the way, when, when they did this with Allah's Messenger, and when they did this with Allah's book, Allah has a right to punish. And it's not like He hasn't done it before. He's taken care of nations before. But He doesn't do that to them. And then they say, oh, why you keep telling us that Nuh was Nuh's nation was flooded and Lut's nation was rained on with fire from the sky, or this nation had winds come and hit them, and this nation had an earthquake? Where's the? Why don't you just punish us then? What's, I mean, we've been we've been listening to you talk about this stuff for years. We've heard the stories over and over again. You know, just bring it. Let's have it. Yastajilunaka bil adab. They literally say in Quran mentions it. They're trying to tell you to hurry up, bring it, bring the punishment already. Let's hurry this up, let's expedite this process. And in response to that, Allah says, Ar-Rahman. <laughs> You've made me plenty angry, you deserve it. But I'm gonna be Ar-Rahman to you. And I'll speak to you differently. This is the mercy of Allah, this is, the, this is why this is the final revelation. The Muslims need to understand. Allah Azza wa Jal, when previous nations defied Him, He would annihilate them. They would not be left on the face of this earth. But Allah did a mercy like He never did before in the history of all the Prophets. By sending Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and sending the most merciful of His kalam. Today people argue that the Qur'an is barbaric or it's violent or it's extreme. You know, and even the, so many Muslims, so many Muslim children, when you ask them, what do you think of the Qur'an? They say it's got a lot of punishments, Allah is very angry, most things are haram. These are the thoughts in their head. These are the thoughts that we've put in our own kids' heads. This Qur'an came as a greater mercy than any other revelation before it. But I wanted to set that stage. What is Surah Al-Rahman doing? How is it changing the perspective of these? These people couldn't be further from Allah. That's the point. The Surah came, the audience of it are people who are not religious, they're not interested in religion, they're not interested in the Messenger. On top of that, they make fun of the religion, and they, they couldn't be further from God. These, these are the people that Allah talked to in this Surah. And I wanted to particularly mention this because if it covers them, it covers anybody less than them. In other words, if, it, if it's talking to the worst of the worst, then it's definitely including less than that, myself, yourself, somebody in this audience that says, well, I, at least I come to pray the Friday prayer. I don't do, any, I don't do much else. And don't ask me what I'm going to do New Year's Eve. 
let's not talk about that right now. But, you know, but at least I'm here. So there are people even among us who slip, who get away from Allah, who go far. And Allah is talking to all, like you, you could think, you know, Allah Quran only talks to good people. Or it's really harsh to bad people. It's not that way. Allah Azza wa Jal gives some very profound, loving wake-up calls. And that's one of the wake-up calls Allah gives is what I wanted to share with you. Yas'aluhu man, actually before that, kullu man alayha fan. Everyone on this earth shall cease to exist. Everyone on this earth, whoever is here, is going to be fan. Fan in, in Arabic from fana. Fana means not just that you'll die. That actually means nobody will remember who you are. There may be a time will come then people don't even know that there was a grave and underneath it is you. Where we're sitting right now, we don't know who was here a thousand years ago. We don't know. We don't know who was here two thousand years ago. And we don't know how deep under the ground they are. And what of them remains, you know? قَدْ عَلِمْنَا مَا تَنْقُصُ الْأَرْضُ مِنْهُمْ we know what the earth takes away from them. We, Allah knows, we don't know. So Allah says, the one reality that needs to settle in your mind is you're not here permanently. You know what happens in our lives day to day? We get so caught up in what's going on today, what we need to finish now, what's gonna happen on the weekend, you know, when are we gonna do this in the next month or two months? People, speak, people think long term, they think, okay, I'm gonna make my two month calendar, three month calendar, I'm gonna make a year calendar. Students are thinking about what courses they're gonna sign up next semester. Our idea of long term is a few days, a few months, some really well planned people, maybe one year, two years in advance, that's how we think long term. But Allah Azza wa Jal makes us internalize, your long term strategy needs to incorporate one thing, death is on your calendar. Death with, a, with an asterisk, it could strike at any time. It's undetermined. Right? It needs to be like a conscious part of your mind and my mind. No matter whether you believe or don't believe, you're serious or not serious, you pray or you don't pray. One reality, you, can't, you could try to escape it. You could pretend it's not there, but it's coming. And no matter how far you run, فَإِنَّهُمْ مُلَاقِيكُمْ It's going to come and hit you. You're not going to exist. كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانِ وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ However, the face, which is an expression in the Qur'an for glory, respect, dignity, the face of your master will remain. وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ What an amazing name, amazing names of Allah. The one who possesses glory and the one who possesses all dignity. Now in Arabic, karam is dignity. Ikram is when you dignify, it's mutaaddi, meaning when you dignify someone. So if for example, I walked in and somebody treated me with respect, that's ikram. Somebody treated me, somebody gave me respect, that's ikram. Somebody praised me, that's ikram. You know, or I, I honored my parents or my, you know, my mother and father or a teacher or somebody else, I did ikram of them. In other words, ikram is not when you're sitting by yourself. Somebody has to come and do ikram of you. You understand? You can't have it like you're by yourself, you live on your own on top of a mountain and you say, I have a lot of ikram. No, no, who's honoring you? Like the birds come and honor you? Who honors you? Somebody has to do it for you. The same thing with glory, jalal. When something has glory, it means somebody glorifies them. But look at what Allah just did. He said, everyone is going to die. Which means no one's left to, to honor Allah and no one's left to glorify Allah. And Allah still owns it. Allah still owns it. You know, there are people who become, when they become far from Allah, they say, why does He need my prayers? Why does He need me to thank Him? Why does, why does God want us to praise Him all the time? I've even met some people who say, why is God so ma'ad Allah? They speak about Allah in these terms. Why does Allah need me to praise Him all the time? You know, anybody else that wants to be praised all the time, we consider them arrogant, full of themselves, needy. Why does God do that? And Allah answers that question, listen, you're all gonna die. And I'm still gonna have what you think I need. I already own all dignity, all nobility, all honor, all glory. And I don't need, Allah is telling us, He doesn't need creation to glorify Him. He already possesses it. He already owns it. So He, he told us something so profound here. Death is on the horizon. And whatever you do, you're not doing it for Allah because you cannot add Allah to Allah's treasure. You can only do whatever you do for yourself. In ahsantum, ahsantum li anfusikum. Even if you're going to do the very best you could possibly do, that very best you did not actually do for Allah, you did it for yourself. Quran says, "Waman jahada fa inna ma yujahidu li nafsihi." Whoever makes whatever struggles, they're only doing it for themselves. 
This is an investment into yourself. When Allah is making you come back to Him, people confuse it and think, I'm being dragged into an obedience of someone else. I'm being dragged to serve someone else. I'm being dragged to do what I don't want to do. And Allah is telling you actually all I'm inviting you to do. You, don't, you want to do it? Go ahead. You want to walk away? Go ahead. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Whoever wants, they can believe. Whoever wants, they're welcome to disbelieve. Quran says openly. You're free to walk away. But if you're going to come towards Allah, then it's only going to be, you're the only beneficiary. You can't benefit Allah. Just like you can't harm Allah, you can't benefit Allah. And so he says, وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ His dignity will remain. It's, this is a problem for you. You know. And then he asks the question, فَبِأَيِّ أَلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ He doesn't even need you, and he keeps you around. He doesn't need you, and he feeds you, provides for you, takes care of you, gives you beauty in your life. He didn't just give you survival. Anybody, people can survive inside a prison cell. He gave you a home. He didn't just give you like, you know, skin alone is enough to survive. He gave you wonderful clothes, air conditioning. He gave you this stuff. But he didn't need to give you anything because he doesn't need anything from you. How, un- how much in denial can you be? فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ What a powerful way to make this argument. To, re- to remind me and to remind you our place before Allah. We can never do enough for Allah. And we can never say Allah owes us anything. You and I can't say Allah owes us anything. People say the silliest things. I made so much dua, Allah didn't answer. Like Allah owes you. Making dua to Allah is not placing an order on Amazon. It's been three days, they said three day delivery. It didn't come yet. Oh forget it, I don't pray anymore because I kept making dua and I still failed my exam. You failed your exam because you don't study. You failed your exam because you didn't get a tutor. You didn't fail your exam because you made dua and Allah didn't deliver his, your order. Who are you to place demands on Allah? Well, our attitude towards Allah has become like a customer. We think of Allah like someone who owes us something. How even our dua has become arrogant. You realize that? Even the way we ask Allah has become arrogant. And Allah is reminding us, how much more in denial can you be? How much more delusional can you be? The word ala in the Arabic language is so profound. They translate this as, how many favors of your Lord will you deny? Favors is ni'am, fada'il, fadl. These are ni'am, these are favors. But the word ala actually comes from ala, adatu tanbih, something that gets your attention. Allah says, I have done so many amazing things around you. All of them are begging for your attention. All of them are screaming, look at what Allah did for you. And you don't pay attention. You're just oblivious. You don't even open your eyes and see what he's done. You know? Every time we get in our cars and we just turn the ignition, who starts the car? Every time you put your foot on the brake when there's traffic cup ahead, who makes the brakes work? It's not BMW. It's not the, the brake pads that you just got changed. It's Allah who stops the car. Yusilu alaykum hafadha. He sent guardians on you to just constantly secure you. There's a security detail around each of us of angels that Allah assigned. <laughs> That's what He did for us. A friend of mine was on a road trip from here to, to New Orleans. And two uh, or three of the bolts of his wheel popped off while he was on the highway doing 80. So the tire can come off at any time. Three or four are gone. And he doesn't know this and he's just cruising at 80. And he gets there and when he parks the car, the wheel falls off. His wheel just falls off. Now when that happens, he says, Ya Allah save me. But you know what? Who, kept, who keeps them on for us? <laughs> now we think that's amazing because they fell off. But who's keeping them on?